Steve Kilby, welcome to Booktopia. Great to be in book. Wow, you've got my book. I know. Wow, I'm everywhere here. Something quite peculiar, and it's yeah. a great book. Congratulations. Thank on you. It. Thank I you. Want, there's, there's a really beautiful line that you have in the book about halfway through when you're talking about um, playing live music, mm. and you say, the audacity to impose my own ideas on four minutes of songs. Yeah. How do you how do you find the differences in pushing your ideas across with those mediums? I think they're all to do with the audacity, the audacity of getting 250 blank pages and putting your story on there, the audacity of having a piece of paper and putting your pastel on there. You know, um, it's all about going, I can do this and I have the perseverance to keep going and not to, um, not to stop, not to, not to sort of um, second guess myself. Just um, so at that basic bottom level is the idea of I'm going to take something that doesn't exist and make it exist. And then it's the same process with music, with writing um, and with painting. You sort of have a vague idea and then the process is to keep massaging into shape, adding bits, taking bits away. Um, but the idea is to never give up. And there were times in the book when I, I stalemated myself and I'd got to a certain point and I'd written something and I didn't know how to, pro how to keep going on from there. And that happens with paintings, sometimes that happens with songs. And the thing is you just gotta keep going back to it. And a lot of people, a lot of people have the audacity to try and start imposing, but then when they start imposing there on that silence or on that blank thing, they start imposing. After a while when it doesn't work out, they stop and go, ah, oh, I could never be an author, I could never be a writer. But the th only really thing that makes me different to them is I kept persevering. And, you know, the first songs I wrote were rubbish. They were awful songs. But I just kept going and going and going. And after 15 years, just like enough monkeys with enough typewriters will sooner or <laughs> later type out the works of Shakespeare, sooner or later, if you write enough songs, you're going to start writing good ones. And, you know, um, persevering with my book, you know, getting, oh God, who's going to read this, oh God, you know, and all the advice you get, like Greg Dooley saying, don't fucking write about your childhood, man, no one wants to read that. You know, that really, when he said that, um, I was telling Robert Forster last night, I was doing an interview, I was like already two chaps in the book and my childhood was really like, oh, I love my mummy, I love my daddy, my childhood's really great, I'm, I'm out walking around in my white thongs, catching tadpoles, and then suddenly a guy I really respect, don't write about your childhood. So you, that sort of sends you into a double thing. So the creative process is always having the, the nerve to persevere and to keep going on and knowing eventually if you follow your modus operandi, you always have something at the end of it. Yeah. So never, never give up. And the way the book opens is, I think, a really nice sort of lead in for the whole story because it opens when you're being about to be inducted into the yeah. Area Hall of Fame. Yeah. And you talk about when you're there and you're sort of just one of the band and looking yeah. at and everyone all of a sudden starts to look at you and you yeah. have to make the acceptance speech. Go, yeah, what are you going to do? <laughs> it's, yeah. It's a really common thing, particularly yeah. with being a songwriter because mm. in a studio, you all mess around, you're all collaborative about trying mm. to get mm. something. Mm. And then the track's down and everyone looks at Steve and says, now it's you. Yeah. You're a songwriter. What was yeah. that pressure like compared to It that? was, well, the difference is when you've written a song, you know everyone's going to look at you and go, right, now you're going to write some words. You know that's coming. But the, real, the truth is we had gone in there and everyone had said, our mantra was, we're going to let the music do the talking. Yeah. Over and over, people were going, we're not going to have a speech. We're going to have the music do the talking. And then... As, as I write, when I got in there and one by one all the people accepting their awards were having nice little speeches and making people laugh and being gracious and all that good stuff <laughs> you're supposed to do when you get an award. You're not supposed to go, thanks! You're not supposed to do that. Yeah. And that I realised, and I don't mind going against the status quo in any situation, but what I don't like is being churlish. Mm. I don't like to be a sort of a, an old grumpy grudge and go, thanks! Now we're going to play our song, you know. I realised I had to, and as I say, very typical, I realised what I should have been working on for three months beforehand, <laughs> I had to come up within like half an hour. Yeah. And, but with that, in that half an hour, I got my mum here, I got my brother here, I got the band around, I got people coming over, congratulations, and finally Lindy Morrison going, what are you going to say? 
I'm trying to... But yeah, but what are you going to say? Yeah. But what are you going to say you're going to say? Yeah, I know that. I'm trying to fucking work it out now. <laughs> yeah, but what is it going to be? Leave me alone. And then by the time she'd finished, they were calling my name. So when I got up there, I was just going, fucking send me a showbiz miracle. And lo, it, it, it materialised. Because since then... I was I was vain enough to think I could do that every time, and since then I've been put in a few situations. Don't worry about, it, I'll figure it out, and it hasn't gone down like yeah. that. Yeah. I'm sort of got these jokes, and no one's laughing, and everybody's moving around their seats. I'm like, Jesus, I thought he was good. So it doesn't always yeah, it doesn't always happen. I just got really lucky yeah. that night. The most enjoyable part of my reading the book, and I think you writing it was uh, sort of a free-form verse where you talk about the touring life. Mm. It's really amazing, and anyone reading the book I think will agree with me. It's just mm. a beautiful piece of writing. Um, tell me about the road life and the touring life. Um, well, road life, um, road, life, road life can be numbing. You know, when we did 101 gigs in a row, um, that was, you know, you sort of get numb, you get numbed. It's a bit like, it's a bit like being at war without, you know, getting shot at. But it's the sort of same thing, bunch of guys turn up in a city and you know there's all the different specialists doing all their stuff and, and life always becomes the same thing. It's like your life gets reduced down to this very selfish thing. For me, um, turn up in a city, got to find a vegetarian restaurant. That's getting easier. But like I've been a vegetarian the whole time so you know, trying to find a vegetarian restaurant, trying to... Um, trying to score some drugs, trying to find some pot, because mm. I don't want to go on stage without smoking dope. Um, you know, and trying to, um, trying to keep the other guys, trying to maintain our sick status quo, whatever it is at the time, <laughs> whatever, wherever I am in the scheme of things. And then, you know, and then our group of friends that turn up in each city. Each city is like a whole trip, and it, you, know, you turn up in Dallas, and there's like 30 people who your band's friends turn up, and trying to keep up with them and all the things they've got going on and uh, you know so it's it's a very focused selfish narcissistic little world and um, it can be very numbing and make you very insulated and and sort of yeah so on one level I, I wanted to get over the kind of the idea of the the regular me tr tr touring around which is most of the chapters and in that bit I wanted to get into a more kind of impressionistic idea that would that would somehow convey it in a better in a more I don't know in a more visceral way yeah get over what's actually going on yeah no it touches on it beautifully when you look back at your childhood now and it's an incredibly Australian childhood mm. um, there's a point when the penny dropped and you started to be influenced by glam rock I think yeah initially and yeah. then you've gone through all the different um, all the different worlds of different rock now where do you see now if someone said to you um, I've never heard of the church tell me about the church tell me about Steve Kilby and his his philosophies on music oh uh, well I'd say um, I'd say I'm a sort of a classicist I'd say really what the church does and really what I do is we take the things from the golden era the, the when the Giants walked when there were the Beatles and the Stones and Dylan and um, you know the period from say 65 to 75 then David Bowie when all the greats made all their great records I and the church take those elements and we recombine them in a sort of a postmodernistic way but we but we, we sort of we're taking the, the elements of the greats we're influenced by the greats our guitarists are influenced by Jimi Hendrix you know I'm influenced by Dylan and Bowie and you know um, we're sort of trying to recombine those classic organic elements that the that the greats had at the dawn of the era. So um, yeah, not you know not so much influenced by all the all the stuff that's happening now. Or and that was how it was in the 80s, and that's why we survived the 80s because we were classicists. And you listen to you listen to the Blurred Crusade, and it still sounds pretty good because it was it was based on the way the Beatles sounded, like an organic kind of rock band. And obviously you were really influenced, speaking of the Beatles, um, yeah. because yourself, when you, you know, you always wanted the bass guitarist, I wanted, a certain yeah, bass guitarist. Yeah, yeah. Kit. I wanted the violin bass. Yeah, I mean, I mean, geez, 
sitting at home looking at that violin bass on TV or looking at it on album covers. I just wanted, I just wanted to get my hands on it. <laughs> I just wanted, to, you know, I just wanted to smell it and touch it and uh, have a look inside the case. And I, I just wanted one just really badly. Like I guess a kid who likes baseball wants a baseball bat or something. I don't know. I just, I just wanted to get my hands on it. I didn't know if I could play it or. I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but something was telling me, screaming in my head, you've got to get one, you've got to get one, you've got to get one, working on my mum and dad all the time. I go, and they're going, no, nah, you're going to give it up. It'll be like everything else you do, you won't follow through. <laughs> but um, no, I just, it was just an intuitive thing, you know? Yeah. But that, it didn't end up being the base for me in the end, but that yeah. it was a good one to start on, yeah. to get that out of my system. Yeah, absolutely. And thank God you did, because I, even now in the office when we were listening to, uh, to some of the back catalogue, we thought, the church. Yeah? Oh, thank you. Thanks so much for coming in. Okay. Congratulations. On Booktopia. <laughs> Local booksellers or Booktopia. That's it. Something quite peculiar from booktopia.com.au. <laughs> <laughs>